thank you everyone for coming. Um, talking about, not rabbits as was on the screen earlier, I'm sorry, um, but powering platforms. Welcome. Um, and how Drupal can be part of, of powering platforms that help give us all power. My name is Benjamin Melanson. I am a worker owner at a, um, a, a cooperative, a worker-owned cooperative. I'm called the Garg. We've um, been in business just under 12 years, and we've been making Drupal websites that whole time. Um, and we're a small enough group um, that anyone you know who has a question, uh, you can interrupt it at any time or, or comment. And so part of my, I mean, in, in, as a co-founder of Agaric and in, in everything I do, I have, um, and people who have worked with me, have really tried to um, put the idea of the most power possible to all people over our own lives. Um, this applies even to um, you know, websites. When we started making websites, uh, people, you know, a web developer, a web designer, what we're still called by some clients. A web designer would put their, you know, their files that they created in um, uh, whatever the, project, the the software that was originally Macromedia by something before Macromedia, and then they didn't, and now it's an Adobe product. Um, but you know, make a static website in a proprietary tool um, and upload those, FTP those onto the server, and the client has no access to that without finding that designer wherever they are and asking them to make some little change. So content management systems were revolutionary in giving more power to clients. Um, and you know that was important to us sort of you know ethically and really important from a business standpoint of, of giving people um, a reason to uh, use our services and uh, uh, having a little more control over the website. Um, from the, the broader perspective, I, uh, I like to say justice and liberty. Um, it's prettier, um, but it's harder to make what we're talking about concrete. Um, there's people who make a whole career as defining liberty as, as something that, you know, is completely ab abstract and of no real world meaning. Um, as much fun as to like Part, you know, destroy an argument that hinges on claiming a person in a pit is as free as a person who is not in a pit, as Hayek uh, has made. Um, no one's got time for that. Um, anyhow, so that's where I'm coming from. Um, and uh, you might ask if I'm so set on changing the world, why have a small business to make websites? And that's a fair question. Um, Back when I had a lot of disposable income because I was working the overnight shift at an extreme discount retailer called the Christmas Tree Shops, um, I had much more money to spend then than I have most of my time as a business owner. Um, might be doing something a little bit wrong. But um, at that time, I was donating and supporting a lot of people who were doing really great work. Um, but watching them have to beg for money in order to do it, um, was not a situation I ever wanted to be in. Um, so after more than a decade in business, it's it's good that never had to beg for money, but haven't had a lot of time to um, try to put um, and do good in the world. So power is coordination, um, and a lot of this talk is about um, how to gain power, and it's it's, it's coordination, it's organization, um, it's uh, you know any group of people without organization um, is less powerful than the group with it. Right now, so the dominant way of organizing us is, is money, um, which is why your money is power, but it's just how are things organized, how are things coordinated. Um, and so I'm triply excited about the software as a service and um, the platform cooperativism movement that pairs with it really well um, in that it's a technology that gives us the power to coordinate like Drupal does give us some power to coordinate, but we've been tending to deploy it for one site at a time. Um, it's 
um, building a platform is um, an exercise in coordination, and we'll need to build even more tech to coordinate as we do it all. Um, so I tend to fixate on injustices caused by an organized, unaccountable minority making decisions affecting a much larger and but unorganized majority. Um, however, there's plenty of problems that have little to do with the problem of concentrated benefit and distributed cost. Um, they're just still problems because we, as society, hasn't gotten their act together, not necessarily because there's one small segment that's strongly benefiting. Um, traffic jams affect millions of people who, while not mostly you know, in the top 1% of income or wealth, are still easily in the top quintile. Um, and, you know, I mean, to be fair, there was an actual criminal conspiracy to tear out um, subways and trolleys and replace it with cars, but, you know, that was mostly 50 years ago um, or more, and the, right now it's just the lack of organization costs. But don't worry, self-driving cars are going to fix all that. <laughs> this is not a self-driving car. Well, it wasn't designed to be. Um, this Jeep was remotely hacked um, through its steering system that was hooked up to the computer system that was hooked up to the internet for the benefit of the media system. Um, Jeep had to recall millions of vehicles because of this. Um, and I mean, like, okay, whatever. This, even capitalists who don't have our best interests in heart are going to find a problem to solution to problems like these. Um, so is it really important for us to control on software and infrastructure? And this is the, um, the first computer virus, um, which has been destroying things for years. Um, and it's, it's just an example of a problem that we have not gotten under control. Um, it's, you know, costs estimates in the, in the $100 billion a year annually range of computer viruses. Um, and I think, think we can do better owning our own tech. Um, and just, I mean, we've gotten a lot of examples of, of what Facebook does with their data, um, but it's Facebook as an example of a very powerful platform that we are, um, many people are relying on for communicating with people. Um, and um, this is Corinne Gaines, who was paranoid about um, police possibly killing her, and she live streamed um, on Facebook all the time. Um, during a police standoff, the um, Baltimore County Police Department asked Facebook to turn off her live feed, and the Baltimore County Police Department killed her very shortly after that. Um, and this has not gotten the attention it should just um, of a moment there. Um, but it's our, I mean, our, so it, it just shows our relationship with technology, who controls it. Um, it. It crossed the fatal line that day, and it continues to happen in smaller and other ways um, all the time. And we lost your screen. Uh, no, I, I went blind. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank Sorry. You. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so it's good to be in Philadelphia, the cradle of liberty, to talk about free software. Libra, free as in liberty software, um, and its connections to other realms of human liberty. Um, William Penn and the other Quaker founders envisioned a city of brotherly love as a place where people of all classes, cultures, and ancestral backgrounds would learn to live together free of violence and tolerance and corruption. Um, and for context, at the time, um, my, my hometown of Boston had hung a few Quakers because of their religious beliefs around 1660. And the Philadelphia and um, the around Philadelphia's founding, the Massachusetts Bay Colony was engaged in a full-scale um, genocide against the Wampanoag Indians and any other Native Americans anywhere nearby, um, because the English settlers were scared to death at this point that they would actually get, you know, pushed back off the land they had stolen, um, and and even like completely converted and assimilated, like in my very hometown of Natick in Massachusetts, there are famous praying Indians that's in standard textbooks, um, the part how they had assimilated and were converted to Christianity, the part where they were sent to Deer Island and Boston Harbor to starve to death isn't covered as much. But over in, here in Philadelphia, um, for a while, Penn's vision of putting his own, his vision, his words, putting the power in the people was, was realized a bit. Um, and this is where, a century after that, 
um, the inalienable rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, and we the people um, were written and celebrated. And, um, you know, the, uh, the you know, very shortly after the Revolutionary War, Philadelphia started already a little bit of a, a tourism industry um, as the, the cradle of liberty thing. And at the same time that that, um, you know, that was being celebrated, that they were putting the, you know, the bell out there, proclaim liberty throughout the land and to all inhabitants thereof. Um, it, it filled out the, Pennsylvania actually um, voted to officially um, not allow black people to vote. It was a little bit um, up in the air for a little bit, um, and um, they voted it out there. And so at the same time, abolitionists are, are actually coined the term Liberty Bell um, and are critiquing um, Philadelphia and Pennsylvania for not living up to these standards. Um, as the bell has not obeyed the inscription and its peals have been a mockery while one-sixth of all inhabitants are in abject slavery. Um, and that's not in Pennsylvania, that's in the South, but um, in Pennsylvania, black men didn't win, win the right to vote until 1870, the 14th Amendment, nationally, and women also was voted down um, in, in, Phil in Pennsylvania in 1915, um, but came in 1920 with the 19th Amendment. Um, and returning to Drupal, um, you know, the Drupal Diversity and Inclusion Initiative is an attempt to, um, is, it, it, you know, at its face, it's a recognition of historic wrongs. And I think it's good as far as it goes, and there are good resources. But the point we're getting at is there are, are grave injustices in the world, and it's the responsibility of all of us everywhere um, to try to remedy them. But let's bring this down to earth. Um, where is this power going to come from? In Drupal, um, the benefits of a Libre Status offering are manifold, and there's sort of three big aspects. Um, so, Libre Status, free software as a service, the ability of someone to, you know, just sign up online, bang, grab a website, um, not have to download it, figure out how to install it, everything else. So. Um, but with free software, so if they do want to run it themselves, they can. So new adopters can get started knowing that they don't have the, a, the dead end or the Wally Coyote situation of the ground being pulled out from under them, which it's easy to get started on a proprietary platform, but you have no guaranteed rights there. You have no idea what's going to happen um, to your access to um, the software you're using. LibreSAS can provide an economic base for code contributions for um, different sorts of, of, of customers, basically, um, when it's a software as a service. But um, as a, um, you know, as a sort of, I mean, think in your own practice, what kind of clients you're not able to serve who might be served as customers of a platform, a lower price point. Um, and so it's an economic base for code contributions that benefit smaller organizations, individuals, um, or just um, use cases that can't afford the level of resources that we have grown used to in, in modern de Drupal development, um, the ambitious websites. Um, and we'll you know, get to the, then there's the benefits for the, the cl customers, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, and this can apply to many software communities, of course, but Drupal 8 is particularly well sorted to provide uh, software as a service, um, as free software as a service. Um, so just turning for a second to some of the, the issues facing Drupal now um, that makes software as a service really important to the future of Drupal um, is that it is much harder to get started with Drupal now. Um, you're not likely to pick it because oh, you wanted to categorize things on a website and you heard Drupal as taxonomy. It's the way a lot of people in Drupal who contributed a lot to, to Drupal got started. Um, now, you're going to just play with some other framework. Probably static site generated this time because it's sort of come full circle and that all of the overhead of getting a content management system up and running is higher than just putting a static site up there. So 
One software as a service, which I'd love to see, I'm not focusing on this talk, but there is some people working on it, is basically static websites separated from GitHub. Right now, it's like you want a static website, you do your editing and your stuff, and it's sort of deployed through GitHub, which is really like you're meant to be a developer. It's everything about it says, only developers are welcome here. If you took static site generation um, and gave it a front end, maybe in Drupal, that's something really friendly to people, um, you could have a really powerful software service. Um, but anyhow, um, you know, it's not fun to get started with Drupal. It's pretty fun once you've got everything up and running, but there's a huge amount of it. And this was really recognized um, in this last DrupalCon. There's a official focus on the development environment and just making it easier for people to get started. Um, and try to get rid of this. And so, I mean, software as a service allows people to just like, like get airlifted right onto the top. And then you start digging down and get into the hard stuff, but only after you've gotten the benefits of just having things up and running. Um, do you need to kick the door open for new contributors? Um, I've been in a sort of running battle in the, uh, in the project application queue. Um, it's much op more open now, and this is one of the main ways people contribute now, is actually contributing code. Um, what software as a service would let people do is contribute configuration, um, but um, yeah, if they know anyone who has trouble with the project application queue, um, you don't need it anymore for anything but the security icon, but there's still a backlog of about a year. So we, we, Drupal as a whole has sort of had its door closed to new contributors for like hard, very hard to get through the door for, for a few years now. Um, I, we need to make up lost ground and sort of the new people we've, we've turned away. Um, so, um, and all of this can be possible because there's actually a good business case for free software and free software as a service. Um, the most successful free software projects have actually been built in large part by people employed full-time by large corporations um, that benefit from the security and stability that free software provides. Drupal is in the fortunate um, experience of being a little bit of an exception, um, but the importance of finding a funding model uh, remains and Floss hasn't competed in user experience because its business model is divorced from users. Um, whereas every cloud service, every software as a service, um, are almost and you know are directly connected to users, but they're actually already almost invariably built on full free software stack. The operating system, the server, the programming languages, the databases, the libraries, all of it. Um, some of it they're contributing back. I mean, Facebook and all contribute tons back. Um, but they're making power piles of money on a relatively thin slice of proprietary code, putting it all, pulling it all together. And Drupal, with the interface, with the user management, everything, has the ability to be that piece of code pulling it all together without being proprietary. Um, and and Dries Beuthart, uh, Drupal's founder, has actually written some of the best stuff on this concept out there. Um, and pointing out that the reason the walled gardens of Facebook and Twitter um, and LinkedIn and all of that are winning is because they have a superior user experience uh, fueled by data and technical capabilities not easily available to their competitors on the open web. Um, and the, you know, But the value on those is the people. The, we are the network on there. Um, we create cause, bring into being the value. Um, the open platforms have disadvantage um, of having to make up um, to make upfront investments that they can't um, pull back. So especially a decentralized platform can't make back the upfront investment um, that one entity controlling a platform can capture the value of when you know, all the money is poured into one entity, they control the network, they do it. But um, the dangers of having one entity control the network have been like really blatant in the news lately, so I'm not going to belabor that. Um, but open platforms have some advantages over closed, um, that more companies can try their ideas, more different needs can be served, um, long tail type of thing. And the core LibreSAS value proposition um, is that the LibreSAS provider, so the same advantage that any software service provide, handles spikes in growth, um, you can switch, but then what regular SaaS can't do is that you can switch provider self-host if it needs demand. So it's actually more attractive to 
businesses who are thinking about the danger of lock-in and the danger of um, putting their technology, their, putting their you know, functionality they need in a technology they don't control. Um, SaaS has the advantage of really of low software, low startup cost, and the Libra part of it, free software, has the option of always self-hosting. Um, control and ownership, Libra SaaS provides, providers can handle the backups and security, um, but you can always take code and data um, for a new provider to your own host. And so the cool thing is there's a whole bunch of SaaS um, offerings using completely free software in the Drupal universe already. Um, Probost.ci from Zivtech, um, sponsor of this camp, and they're here in Philadelphia, um, says it very clearly and beautifully on the website. Probo is both a SaaS app available um, at app.probo.ci as well as an open source software project available at github.com slash probo.ci. That's the root of Libre SaaS. Um, you both free software, you're both software as a service, so people can use it easily, and then you are um, available as open source. And a lot of companies that are doing this, like gitlab.com, which are keeping most of their code open, sort of have two revenue models. The software as a surf service model of people paying um, monthly, and then the sort of the custom implementation for people who need greater needs because you're the expert on this software. Um, and so the same reason that people adopt open source for the level of control that it gives them, um, the same reason companies choose to start with software as a service and then scale up as um, they find it available. Um, and then with Drupal itself, Rumify is, um, and I'm picking all Drupal 8 examples because I'm really excited about Drupal 8, um, but Rumify is updated to Drupal 8 and they create booking engines with, with Drupal and they both, you know, the modules are available for you to use um, and also software as a service. Open Social um, is, came out of uh, work that Gold Gorilla did for Greenpeace and they're like, I think this can be useful for a whole lot of people. And, um, and they've been um, using it. And this is at a somewhat higher, higher price point, but still you know, a lot cheaper than getting your own website. Um, fortunately, they have no branding right now, but Round Earth from My, My Drop Wizard is working on a Drupal distribution um, intended as software as a service. And ThinkShout's Bene distribution should probably get a mention here. Um, which they've created not so much as software as a service, but to lower the cost of them providing websites. And so it's sort of a middle ground. Um, but I do think that the um, key for uh, Drupal distribution is to actually be a real software as a service, because that is when you can um, charge monthly. Uh, yes? You said um, ThinkShout what? It, the, it's B-E-N-E is their distribution. Um, and they're not currently offering it as a service, but they they made it so that they could, like, basically lower. I think they said lower the cost of doing a website from like 100k to like 20 to 30k. Um, and you know they made it open so other people can adapt. Other shops that are serving not for profits, similar to the ones they serve, can adopt and contribute back to it. So it's sharing like a true. What's this? This is. Um, just a directory, um, I, ioo.coop, Internet of Ownership, um, dot co-op, and it is a list of platform cooperatives. And so um, the- Ioo.coop. Yep, yeah, and I got a list of the these uh, domains at the end. So the, so the ideal is the, the cloud of software as a service, the cooperative, ownership um, of a platform cooperative, so one member, one vote. Um, this is obviously not necessary for a software as a service or Libre SaaS, but I think it gives the, the compelling argument of, of real ownership and you know, building more power for people much more strongly. Um, um, yeah, so there's a platform, platform.coop and IOO.coop is 
tons more information on platform cooperatives, um, but I'm not focusing on this that part today. Um, so, just one piece of, of specific tech um, coming into Drupal that makes the idea of not just shared ownership, but actually more distributed control of of the sort of interaction social processes is in the indie web camp movement, indie web. Um, and Swentel has made this a reality. There's an indie web module um, in, in Drupal now. And um, we're looking forward to bringing it into the distribution I'm working on. So um, where and when to leap from custom services to SaaS. Um, the, the, the first part of this is the same thing any, any business school is going to uh, teach you, uh, which is if you're starting a business, you look for barriers to entry. Um, the economics department of your local university is part of the propaganda arm of capitalism, and they'll emphasize perfect competition. The business school, the people for people who will be operating in actually existing capitalism, um, will emphasize barriers to entry to remove as much competition as possible. And we're talking about with Libra SAS, giving away the code. So one of the top usual items for barriers to entry, patents or other proprietary technologies, is, is out the window. Um, but um, Libra SAS does give you an advantage in research and development, because um, you're not going it alone. Um, but your main advantage for actually starting um, a software as a service is going to be um, your um, relationship with clients and potential clients. So essentially, if you do have a little bit of a specialty, and if you're getting a lot of requests from people where you have to tell them in some nice way, I'd love to help you, but you don't have enough money, um, this is the possible point of bundling people, 50, 100 people with similar needs together, and and uh, and building it, um, and yeah, and, and this is where like the most important thing is to listen to the the, the customers, um, listen to the potential people who have a need out there, um, at an organization for platform cooperatives, uh, at a at a conference for platform cooperatives. Um, um, Ed Whitfield of the Fund for Democratic Communities was listening to web developers talk about building technology platforms for journalists and for readers and for other things. And he's just like listening to all the web developers talk and not talk about the real needs of the clients. And he said, it sounds like a discussion about building a marketplace organized by the people who make the tables. Um, <laughs> love that quote. And it's the idea to keep in mind um, the needs of, of the client. And so a use case from Agaric, an uh, example from Agaric, where we have never specialized. We don't have a niche. We don't, you know, do just one type of client. We've done huge corporations, tiny not-for-profits, different university governments, everything else. Um, we still actually have a chance of having a sort of an organic software service come from our clients. Um, we did a site called Find at Cambridge, um, which is just to help find kids' activities in Cambridge. They put a ton of user research into it. Um, and we get to be part of that process and learn it. And now they're like, please like take primary ownership of this. And absolutely, if you can get other cities to sign on, we can do it. And so we're like, OK, this is a Drupal 7 site. If we can get just 10 cities to sign on at you know 20k initial development each, we'd have the $200,000 that this project needs to come to fruition. Um, and that's pretty doable. And so it all depends. Like, for, with that project, we're looking for you know, 10 to 20 cities to, to kickstart it, to get in coordination. And the time and effort in trying to coordinate people is, is quite hard. Um, but if it's a small enough group that can put up enough money, um, yeah enough money each to cover the initial development, or in our case, because we have some expertise here, the redevelopment into a, into a platform style, um, it's, it's totally worth it. Um, for this other software as a service, which I'll talk about later that we're working on, we're aiming for like $50 a, a month or $500 a year from you know thousands. But you know, so it's a different target, but 
um, basically the idea is that you find the market first. You know, you, you know what you can want to build. You know it's possible to do in Drupal. Um, and you line up the 500 potential customers or 1,000 potential customers or whatever the price point um, versus number of clients is to fund the initial development and get that money first. Um, much easier said than done, um, but we're making some progress there. The, the key thing is setting expectations. Client versus customer. You have to um, pick one thing at a time. So the really big thing is to clean separation between when an organization is a client of your consulting firm, say, and when an organization is a customer of your platform. Um, it's about managing expectations. Um, so someone using a Facebook group as an, you know, for, as an organizational tool doesn't expect full customization. Um, and at this, for exactly the same reason, when you build software as a service, you can build in some customization. Drupal supports a lot of that. But you can't have someone who is coming to be a customer of a platform. They can't expect the same level of customization, um, especially you know, at their $50 a month, as your client expects for um, you know, their 30000 or more dollar project. Um, so it's you know making that clean separation is is key. And the goal isn't to cannibalize your custom development, um, but allow you to add value on top of a platform for clients who could not individually afford custom development. And sort of like the, the Benny distribution by Think Shout, um, it, it's pretty easy to build in a model where you have the straight software as a service and then you have um, sort of an intermediate one an intermediate one where you do more customizations where you host it separately you allow yourself to throw in more modules throw in some custom code once in a while um, with the idea that you might bring it back to the overall software as a service but this is for clients more like you traditionally have that you know, have some serious money to throw into their specific needs. Um, but thinking distribution, thinking platform the whole time allows the, for me, the nirvana of, of always being contributing to something that's going to serve more than one purpose. It's not going to just serve this one client. We get to contribute it back into the community as a core or contrib project. Um, but it's sustainable because it's going into a platform that we actually get to sell. Um, so Drupal 8's advantages for being a Libre SaaS, a software as a service solution. Um, it's configuration management. It's um, templating layer, um, which is no longer in the program language PHP. The theoretically more secure templating layer that you can give people access to as a service. Whereas you don't want to give people access to PHP on a software as a service platform to the actual program, you could give people access full control over the templating and styles, um, which, is, which is really powerful um, and could sort of create a whole new um, sort of group of, of another chunk ecosystem. So there's a lot of people doing quick design one-offs for um, Squarespace and stuff like that. But it's sort of the equivalent of the CSS injector that you could have on Drupal. And so for people who want to have some level of professional development, have some control over the HTML, be able to use SAS and real stuff in there and, and pro other preprocessors of any kind they choose um, for the styles, um, Drupal as a service could give that control. So they don't have to worry about functionality or the hosting or anything else, but have a lot of control of the design. Drew has a long life cycle. Um, the idea of drawing a software as a service on Drupal 7, knowing that you have to rebuild it on Drupal 8, is not encouraging. There is no promise, but there is much more hope of a Drupal 8 to Drupal 9 um, being a, a smooth upgrade rather than uh, you know your just going to have to migrate the content. Although Drupal's migration capabilities is a strong plus in its favor also. 
um, in being able to move from other platforms or being able to, you know, stay, you know, be basically being able to have some radical improvements to your platform and this migrate the content because you have everybody on the same platform. You know what kind of content types they have. You know, although you could let them create their own, you know what the content model is for the most part, and you can build an upgrade path there. Um, and then, of course, Drupal 8's regular improvements in core um, are huge. And the idea that you could do a software as a service that uses Drupal as the sort of editing end, but gives people even more control than the templating layer with the decoupled capabilities to do whatever the heck they want in the front end is pretty exciting. So, the technical hurdles. Um, Configuration management. Um, so right now, if you take a distribution and you change the site name in configuration, you basically fork the distribution. So the potential of distributions is completely hobbled in Drupal 8. Um, and I should have I moved the slides a little bit, but the software as a service they're working on, we're working on, and that. That isn't that. Well, I mean, and everything I put here has inspired me to do a uh, Libre SaaS uh, platform cooperative in Drupal. Um, but the one we we're working on is called Drutopia. Um, and Nedra Rogers, who is um, who um, who is, is the founder of that project, I actually I joined it. Um, but he was pointing out the problems with the configuration managed initiative for Drupal seven. Um, for, for Drupal 8, way back, you know, when Drupal 7 was still the standard, he's like, the Drupal 8 configuration management initiative is great, but it's too tightly focused on the dev test live workflow. So it's great for a large team. Everyone can export the whole configuration and, and, uh, and commit it to code, and someone else on another machine can bring it in and pull it up as long as they're all working on the same site, but it's like 100% tied to the site. So we've done the work of sort of being able to put the configuration into um, features of a distribution, basically the features module used for what it was intended to be in the first place, which is packaging up discrete pieces of configuration. But now the next piece of being able to um, take, take this distribution where you can enable and disable features and allow this layer of custom customization on top of it. So the idea is that like, yeah, you have distribution that has all of these capabilities. If you want to um, you know, change the site name, change the number of pages on a view, change some colors, enable comments on one content type, maybe even create another content type, create a bunch of web forms, all the really powerful things you can do in configuration in Drupal 8, um, you want to be able to keep all of your customizations and still deploy updates that come from the distribution. So that's the huge technical hurdle that is we're working on now. The good news is that the rest of Drupal has sort of caught on, and it's now an initiative coming from Dries and Acquia that we need to figure out how to do configuration management for use cases other than um, dev test live. Um, so that's not solved yet, but it's pretty heartening that we're not trying to solve it on our own anymore. Um, it's actually hard to do a shared code base in Drupal 8, which is a pretty fundamental advantage of doing software as a service. It's like, oh, we have a thousand sites, but everything's in one PHP opcode cache. That, for reasons I don't even understand, is hard to do in Drupal 8. There's an issue open for that it's being worked on. Install profile inheritance is another thing sort of holding back the ability to um, do it. But this one is mostly solved. There's a patch. It's just not in core yet, even though everybody wants it in core. Um, but like the Thunder distribution that comes after the Lightning distribution is using this, this patch for all of its, um, its work. So those are the really big technical hurdles. Um, once those are down, the ability to do custom configuration on top of um, a distribution and to run you know, thousands of sites off of one code base, but separate databases, separate, um, you know, separate configuration management just for that custom layer, um, and you know, flavors of install profiles, flavors of distributions. Um, that's it for technical barriers. I mean, you're always going to have tons when you're doing a platform, but those are those Drupal specific ones that we're facing. Yes. So. Um 
Could you be a little more detailed about what you like an example of when you're saying you could be running thousands of instances based off of some common code base? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I, I guess Rumify is a good example. Say you created, um, you know, right now I think they're yeah. And so. Um, you, you've created with or or with commerce just you know commerce module and distribution route. You've created a distribution that allows people to you know book and pay for rooms, and um, and you're making this available to you know independent bed and breakfast types that don't want to only work through Airbnb or don't want to only work through one of its competitors that they want to be able to have their own flow. Um, or they have larger different needs. Whatever, you know, same reasons anytime you need a little bit more than what some standard software as a service is offering. Um, instead of, you know, building that site for them custom, they use the distribution. But then there's the added efficiency economy of scale of, you know, it's, the code base is locked down. It's, you know, these 53 commerce modules and these 17 <laughs> Rumify modules and Drupal core and you know another module is, or three you wrote for the integration um, and so um, if you put that on one server um, and you're not giving anyone access to the PHP it's reasonably secure um, if that should be really efficient because you know you have one code base um, so like for a thousand sites um, like instead of instead of it being as expensive as it is for like if you put it on a thousand different droplets um, it's you know it's more like um, you know the, the code only has to be loaded into memory once and so, so you just have multi site and none or, of us you talking about like uh, yeah. a thousand different you know yeah. sites with vlooks it's sites with vhosts. Like, vhosts. You know. Yeah, no, definitely separate vhosts. Virtual hosts. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So yeah. they're not domain module. No, not domain module. Like, I mean, again, you, that's a workaround, but none of like. <sighs> it's like it, then then you get gets much more brittle about like I just want to up you know I want to do a rolling upgrade like I don't want to upgrade a thousand at once I want to upgrade you know five at once and see how that goes and then five more and then five more and if it's actual multi site it's much harder. So separate vhost sim linking basically, you know, is, is the technology we're looking for on a on a Unix like a, a GNU Linux platform, is that all of their virtual hosts sim link to one code base, and that the the plat and the server knows it's one code base, so it doesn't bother spinning up again. And that works in Drupal seven. It's not really working in Drupal eight, um, <laughs> and but it can be made to work. It just wasn't thought about. Um, so, okay. So then I had. Um, so, no, yeah. no. Um, and, and, then, and then the thing is, the idea is that you can have one code base, but the configuration can vary. You don't want the configuration to be too wildly out of sync, or it's going to be really hard to, you know, manage the platform. But, you know, you could allow the, um, you know, the themes to com be completely different, and you could allow the, you know, lots of customization in the configuration. Um, yeah. So you're saying it is working in Drupal seven? I mean, it's possible to make it work, or it's even yeah. working. For it's working. It's it's yeah. It's honestly, I have not quite understood that exactly that technical issue yet. Um, it, yeah, <laughs> I really don't. So it is working. In it is working in Drupal seven. Yeah. Drupal yeah. Yeah. Yep. That doesn't make a lot of sense. No. Um, and so yeah, there's there's a blog post um, called like you know changed my view um, by, um, well, I'll, I'll pull it up later, uh, but yeah. Well, actually, I do it, have it up right now. So changed my view by Kevin Rainin, um, where he just lists all the reasons why D8 isn't the best upgrade path for a thousand Drupal 7 um, educational sites. And so he's hitting most of the pain points that um, anyone trying to do uh, Drupal 8 as a service is doing, because, yeah, yeah. There is basically lots of people doing Drupal as a service. They're just doing it inside institutions. And so I'm sort of talking about taking the same capability and saying, let's 
let's open it up, let's make it so it's not just for universities and their various departments and professors, let's do software as a service that's for, um, you know, wide open for specific niches out there, for restaurants, for um, small not-for-profits, which is what Drutopia focuses on, um, which is the least profitable, so there's plenty of other niches for people to find, um, and for uh, um, everything else. So, um, yeah, Drupal has, um, you know, a power to change the world that isn't just theoretical. Um, openmedia.org um, started with no budget, I know, because I was doing the early work. Eventually, I told him I couldn't get the work done for free uh, anymore, um, but he found other people, and he also found money, um, and it's been very successful um, in, in fighting these campaigns, like for net neutrality. And um, there's actually been a spin-off Drupal services um, based service from it to provide um, campaign engagement tools. I'm not going to focus on them because they're not LibreSAS yet. They're still they're not sharing the code yet. Um, but it's an example of spinning off uh, functionality from uh, a single Drupal site and providing it for many. Um, but anyhow. Uh, Net neutrality is still a fight. This is always an evergreen flag. I have a, if you're not freaking out, you've not, you're not paying attention thing about net neutrality, openmedia.org or freepress.net, um, both of which do some Drupal sites and this fight are good to get for. Um, I'm running close to time. But just... Yeah, skip to the finish pretty quickly. Um, so, goals for humanity by way of a software project, and have one in mind, Utopia. Is we can communicate widely with one, another, with one another. We stay in control of our communication. We earn livings, which give a degree of freedom. We put disadvantaged people first in opportunity. Um, we gain the most power possible over our own lives. And we use the experience in collective action um, this entails to work further for justice and liberty for all. Um, and what leads to long-term success in the software community, even one that has more down-to-earth goals, um, like, you know, Drupal doesn't tend to talk about that stuff a little bit as much, but it does a little bit. Um, but new contributors with new ideas is key. Um, and so a lot of this whole argument is that making it easier for new people to get involved, new um, ways to enter into um, Drupal and other Libre software um, by providing as a service and providing it easy ways to, to get involved by, wow, you can just configure right there and you have power right at your fingertips. And then when you want more power, you can get involved in the platform, you can get involved in the software, or you can take it off of the platform and, and mess with it yourself um, or hire someone else to mess with it for you. Um, and does require people to continue to join and pay to use. Um, doesn't have to be software as a service, but software as a service is a great opportunity to get the money to the right people. Um, in, turn, in, in, in my opinion, of making sure that the fundamental code um, work is compensated and that we're prioritizing um, um, you know, providing opportunities for people. Um, people feel they have meaningful control. And I think this is where we're starting to get an advantage for free software and Libre SAS, free software as a service. Um, it's because um, the feeling of meaningful control, which has largely been an illusion on pr proprietary platforms, is, is fading um, for a lot of people, especially in terms of basic things like control of their personal information and data. Um, and so feeling like they have meaningful control and actually having meaningful control um, is the, you ultimately need the second one also to people really do have meaningful control. Um, principle of solidarity, making sure everyone, every success helps others level up and a platform cooperative, uh, so Libre software as a service can embody this as you learn in one place for one campaign, for one site, for one not-for-profit or for whatever you build your distribution for, um, your service for, you can, um, hand it, you can build it for others. You can, you can take that learning and, and distribute around it. Controlling your infrastructure is key. Um, 
the platform cooperative portion um, is means having an actual democracy. Um, it is a goal for Jutopia to be sort of a more democratic corner of Drupal. Um, but to practice democracy, which puts those who are most affected first, like sort of a decision making by those who are affected, which plays out in tons of levels, um, some of which does privilege the people doing the work. Sometimes it's privileging the people who have to live with the results of the work. Um, uh, but it's a lot of cool sort of governance work we're doing there. Mm -hmm. um, I just looked at, there's a lot of Drutopia modules. Yeah. Um, are those basically features? Yes. With some extra sauce? Yep. Okay. Yep, 100% features. So goal is they should be pretty thin wrappers if there aren't things that are fully contributed, um, which is, so like there's a, a donation feature which is wrapped around a module called Give that I, that I made and that's in progress. Um, and, you know, um, from a, a cooperative focused group, um, the idea that to really change the world, we have to build things at scale, um, which Drupal already does. Um, but, um, but this allows us to bring the, the scale at which Drupal operates in an organization that interfaces directly with, um, with users. So. Drutopia is the platform cooperative Libre SaaS that, um, that I'm involved with and trying to work on, but I think there's room for tons more. Sharing some technology for sure, certainly the fundamental configuration things we need to get worked out in Drupal core, but also for deployments, um, for various modules, um, for all of that. So build a website as a service platform providing sites for grassroots groups and not-for-profits use the revenue to build the best platform for grassroots groups, activists, organizers, and movements, including communication and relationship management tools, expanding the offerings, and use that revenue and membership to build the most powerful communication network in the world under democratic control. So that's the plan. Um, it's a lot to chew on, um, but no reason not to get started. Did bring a rabbit back. So I'm with you 100%. <laughs> Now my question is, are you eventually going to get to a system, because like, you know, Slack and Facebook are actually, you know, the things that hold the messaging between, you know, silos and silos. Yeah. Are you expecting Drutopia to develop something like, so I go self-host this, but I want to, you know, get some of your data, because, you know, like, so is, is that also going to be like with authentication protocols yeah. that, that's going to be built into the... Yeah. Um, and so that is... Indie web is one of the things we're banking on for that kind of stuff. That's one that's like the most like the most open way of sharing data between things. It's like any website anywhere can do it. Um, we're also looking deeply into something called the Open Supporter Data Interface or Initiative, OSDI, OpenSupporter.org, um, which is um, meant specifically for sort of um, campaign-based, cause-based grassroots groups to be able to, um, you know, have some of their information in, like, Nation Builder and some of it in something else. So to start to, to share that. Um, we have a, a, uh, a Mattermost instance up, which is a free clone of, of Slack, so chat.drutopia.org, you know. Um, we're definitely not trying to do everything in Drupal, although... You know, there is really cool stuff like, um, you know, end-to-end -end encryption supported inside Drupal for chat already. And it's like, all right, well, you know, if your people are going to be signing on to the site to post content anyway, is it that much harder to get them to, to chat there and share also? I mean, there's always the problem of, like, you know, I mean, and, and these groups face it also. Like, their audience may be on Facebook. Their um, audience may be on WhatsApp. Um, you know, it's like, and so, you know, building integrations is key. Um, the indie web tools are good at that also. Um, their concept is Posse, Posse, um, publish once, um, syndicate, share everywhere. Share everywhere. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yes, and, uh, and, and yeah, and I mean, unfortunately, like the, I mean, it's, 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 it's always back and forth with the, the APIs on Facebook, like the, a lot of people are like, well, I'm going to opt out of all of the, uh, all the 
all the APIs that use Facebook, so there's less things that have access to my data. Unfortunately, if you do that, you no longer see the content of friends who might be publishing on their indie website website first mm -hmm. and pushing from there onto Facebook. Um, so, so figuring out the and there's an application called Bridgey, which is from from Indie Web that actually does that pushing. And so, like, it's called Bridgey because it's, we're figuring out the bridge between existing social networks where people are and and building new ones. Um, yeah. Um. Is some of this stuff, uh, like, is, I know the RDF is like saying, you know, this object has yeah, these yeah. things. So is there some type of RDF type thing going yep. in schemas? Yep. Like yeah, so like microformats are a super lightweight idea of, of RDF. And I, you know, I, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I was burnt by microformats community not wanting to, you know, like, they've kept everything really general and the whole point is you need to agree on specifics, specifics and everyone uses them um, and so I was like an RDF this is pretty cool because you can more realistically define your own things and share that um, and then IndieWeb is going back to microformats but it's a community of hashing out what the specifics we need to do um, and then, then there's parallel things like the um, the what what Mastodon um, and and GNU Social use they use a shared um, um, yeah th there's now a specification for these kinds of pushing and sharing um, so there's a whole awesome world there my interest is like yeah where do we get the economic base to start standing and and building these kind of things like where's the yeah how do we drive um, development that really empowers people and doesn't funnel them into the next sort of closed walled garden um, system because there's dangers there. Um, stop now. Thank you very much, all stay. Um, and please give me information, questions. Um, yeah, I'm, we're, we're building this. I'm really excited not to be alone on something, to have joined something, not started it. So um, yeah, this is happening. Thank you. It's not a question, but I just want to say for uh, anybody that's that's interested, I'm actually giving a presentation in the last block, uh, migrating uh, my site revolutionary output from D7 to D8. And the site is um, about uh, it's this concept I came up with called socialism and orange is the new black, where um, it's basically you're thinking about what would the lives of the characters on the show be like if we lived in a socialist political economic system. So I think if you were interested in, in this talk, I think you would also be interested in, in that one. It's gonna be mostly about code and Drupal and stuff, but still some stuff about the science in there too. Right? But the I, content you're migrating is awesome. Yeah. We run into this problem with clients all the time. It's like, I gotta stop reading their website. I gotta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I came to this session, I didn't really know what it was gonna be about, but I'm familiar with the Garrick from like, Almost 10 years ago, I saw you guys present at uh, an anarchist book fair in New York. It was, it was pretty cool. So this was cool too. Thank you. And I will throw cards up front here. Front of the throw me your info too. Yeah. Oh. Everybody wins. Uh, That's what you <laughs> I mean, yeah, this was good. I wasn't expecting um, philosophical. I wasn't expecting oh, yeah, Hayek. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> apparently, apparently, half yeah. yeah. the room was like, so there's, 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 there's more leaves like, like I'm sad. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. Thank All right. you. Yeah, Take care. Thank you. Thank you.